class, I'm gonna start recording. Uh, the class is real short. The material is, is real short because it has a lot of examples. If you had the chance of review this class in your books, by the way, uh, Mr. Dubois, you need to go to school in order to collect your economics books. Economic book. Who's the other one? I don't remember. I sent I sent a couple of emails reminding you guys that you need to go and pick up your books. Okay, Dubois, you need to uh, call to school and set an appointment in order to pick up your uh, your book. Please do it. Gonzalez. 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 Where are you, Gonzalez? Juan Gonzalez here. Okay. Okay, let's begin the class then. Let's begin. Let's open the PowerPoint and talk about this topic. Okay, trend and new economics. Trend and new economics. So today's topic is about modern economies in a global age. And I, I told you already, it's basically mixed economy. Now the objective of this chapter is to identify the main characteristic of a mixed economy, understand why most modern economies are mixed economy and explain why modern economies are becoming increasingly global. Now over here you see the vocabulary. This, is, this would be vocabulary number five because this, this is the fifth topic we are starting in this second term, okay? So this is vocabulary. Remember you need to write the vocabulary, the title, and then the vocabulary. Vocabulary number five, only four words. Okay, let's begin. Today's mixed economy. Today, the mixed economy and economic system that has elements of market, market and planet or command economies is the most common type of economic system. Traditional economies such as in the least developed countries, also of los países menos desarrollados, are everywhere on the decline. As the global economy brings elements of both market force and government involvement. Now, over here, this is an example that talks, uh, give us some exam uh, example that give us uh, evidence of this, uh, this type of mixed economy, okay? Now, let's look at the a farming family in the rural Midwest of the United States to see how elements of all three Economic system may be presented in a mixed economy. Now, for example, the family has owned and operated the farm for many generations. So we learned that the grand, 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 grandparents, and it's been passing on through generation to generation to another generation. Okay. Now they use the most modern farming methods because that's belong to the. Um, Mix uh, the, the, the market economy. The family members still cling to some old custom, and that's an example of a traditional economy. At harvest time, everybody works to get in the crops. The harvest time custom the family follow represents the influence of a traditional economy. So everybody is involved in knows what to do during the harvest time. Guys. Now the family's crops are sold on the market. And also, uh, the uh, uh, market economy are presented in the private property rights and entrepreneurship of the family members. This is an example of market economy. This is the second. And the last one, the two grandparents, los, gron, los, los dos abuelitos, receive a social security, el cheque de la jubilación, check every month. Well-maintained highways, la carretera también está bien mantenida, se mantienen bien, connect the farming, and two teenagers in the family attend the public school. And quien se encarga de todo eso? The command economy are reflected in the way that government has become involved. El gobierno se envuelve en, esta, en estos aspectos y otros más. Okay, so over here you see how mixed economy is involved in, in for instance, in United States economy. Okay, let's move on. Two type of mixed economy. Although all modern economies are mixed, they often emphasize on type of systems or another. The United States essentially has a market economy system. 
even though they are traditional and common elements. Many European countries have a more even mix of market and common economy. France, for example, tried to find a middle way between socialism and capitalism. They mix both types of economy. Now, esta es la parte que yo quería ver y yo tengo un video que se lo voy a poner ahorita mismo. Now, the Swedish, los suizos, government and government rela related organization own about, owns about third of all Swedish companies. Ellos son los dueños más o menos de la, de la mitad o de un tercio de las compañías que están en ese país. Eso no se ve en todos en todo lados, ¿ya? Now, today's mixed economy, type of mixed economy, you might say basically has market system. But also you, you can see some elements from planet system, okay? European countries, greater mix of market and command elements. France government controls some industries, provides social services, for instance. Now, Sweden states own part of all companies, aparte de todas las compañías, a lifelong benefits and the high tax. Esta es la parte que yo le voy a poner un video para que vean. Por ejemplo, yo, yo tengo entendido que en Sweden, por ejemplo, si yo gano mil dólares, chicos, if I, if, I, if I earn one thousand bucks, one thousand dollars, now the government is going to take me the sixty percent of those one thousand dollars that I earn. So it means that the, the government is going to keep six hundred dollars. And they only, I am going to receive only $400. That's crazy. But you see why. You see why? Because I brought this video that explained it. Okay. Now, Namibia is an example of a traditional, but uh, also they, they have some part of a command because the state supports market and foreign investment. Okay. Let's stop right here. Uh, for instance, this one, okay, this, this one, this, I'm going to read this as an introduction of the video that I want to I wanna play for you guys. These citizens receive cradle to grave. Cradle to grave significa desde que nacen hasta que se mueren. The cradle es, eh, es eh, 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 gatear hasta la grave que es hasta, hasta, hasta que se mueren. Grave que es el, 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 el ¿cómo se llama? La lápida. Social benefits. Uh -huh. This include Childcare for children aged from one through five years old. Schooling for children aged from six. Porque allá, allá, ellos comienzan a los cinco años que comienzan. No es como acá en Panamá. A los cinco es comienzan a ir a la escuela. From six through 16. Additional years of school and college for those who choose them. O sea que todo esto, el gobierno se encarga de todo esto, chicos. Claro, te sacan el 60% de tu salario. Se encargan de todo eso. The health care, dental care, paid time off for raising families and generous old age pensions. In return, however, the Swiss pay very high taxes. In some cases, as high as 60% of income. Muy bien. Let's stop right here and I, I, I run into this video that talks about this uh, kind of system that takes place in Sweden, okay? Now, pay attention to this. This is crazy, man. This, that's why a lot of people wanna come to America and stay here, for instance, in Panama. And Let's talk about taxes. They're a big political issue, especially now. New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has proposed a 70% marginal tax rate on wealthy Americans as part of her Green New Deal. Today is the day that we truly embark on a comprehensive agenda of economic, social, and racial justice in the United States of America. It sounds like a big number, but there's another country where some workers are paying similar taxes. Sweden. This Nordic country is often known for its picturesque landscape, ice hockey prowess, and companies like IKEA and Volvo. But Sweden is also known to have some of the highest taxes in the world, and without costing its economy. So how did a country with fewer than 10 million people pull it off? This is Torben Andersen. He's a professor with the Department of Economics and Business Economics at Aarhus University in Denmark. The short version of the story is that Sweden and 
the other Nordic countries, they have high taxes and they have a fairly good economic performance. A simple explanation is that you cannot judge the effect of taxes without knowing what they are financing. And in the Nordic countries, a large part of taxes goes to finance education, health and other things which in, in various ways actually support the labor supply and high employment rates. In other words, Sweden has been able to support both high taxes and high economic growth because of how it spends those taxes. Tax revenue supports generous childcare programs, gives employees vast leave of absence opportunities, and helps offer basically free higher education. Those programs in turn help make Swedish citizens more employable. They also don't have to ration big portions of their paychecks to things like daycare or student loans. That makes them better consumers. The average tax wedge for a Swedish worker with an average income is about 43%, but the income tax can go as high as 61.85%, depending on how high the income is. And the corporate tax rate lies at 21.4%. What's a tax wedge, you might ask? It's the difference between what a worker pays in total taxes and what it costs to employ them. Basically, the difference between your take-home pay and your total pre-tax paycheck. It's also a measure of how taxes can drag down employment. Sweden has had pretty steady GDP numbers since its recession in 2012 and during the 2008 crisis. And even before that, Sweden suffered a severe recession back in the 1990s. And prudent reforms to its banking system and regulations helped it bounce back in a big way through the next few decades. Sweden now has the 12th highest GDP per capita in the world. In fact, other high-tax Scandinavian countries like Norway and Denmark also ranked in the top 10 countries when it comes to GDP per capita. The Swedish tax system has, uh, of course, income taxes, but also has high level of social contributions. At the end of the day, it's not so important whether taxes are collected in one way or another. There's still a wedge in the labor market, creating a difference between the cost of uh, labor to, uh, to the employer and the take-home wage after taxes and all social contributions to the to workers. So for example, a single worker making roughly 726,000 Swedish krona a year in salary, or about 78,000 in US dollars, would have a marginal tax wedge of 69.7%. That percentage is nearly what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is suggesting, but she's saying that this tax rate would apply to those making over $10 million a year. Where do these tax dollars go in Sweden? They pay for things like child care, health care, and education. But if you look at an average family, yes, they pay taxes. But then on the other hand, they don't have any expenditures on education for the kids and so on. So um, they give out, out a lot of money with one hand, but they also get appreciated services back. And, uh, of course, they not the thing is perfect, but still they get value for, uh, for money. And, and, and you can also see that politically there is very important support for maintaining this system. But it's up to the Swedish politicians to decide how to spend tax revenue. This is Johan Norberg. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. We've got more revenue from the people, so the politicians can put it to work where they find it most of, of interest to people or to themselves. You pay when you work and it's distributed to yourself when you have children or when later on when you need more health care or something like that. So it's more redistribution within the life cycle of people, more than a redistribution between different groups of people from the rich to the poor. And uh, so it means more public services, but it also means that we pay for it ourselves. So what's the big deal against high taxes? In Sweden, they get you to operated health care and higher education that doesn't put people in six-figure debt. In the U.S., advocates for lower income taxes say they stifle economic growth and consumer spending. So therefore, we have this paradox with Sweden and the other Nordic countries that taxes, tax wages are relatively high, but at the same time, employment rates are high. So it's hard to say that taxes or tax wages in themselves are causing huge negative effects on employment. That, that's simply not the case. In fact, Sweden has one of the highest employment rates with over 77% of working age citizens employed as of the third quarter of 2018. To compare, the same rate clocks in at 71% in the United States. A 2012 study showed that countries with higher taxes can stifle entrepreneurial success. But that hasn't been the case in Sweden. Some tax dollars go into a leave of absence program that allows a worker to take unpaid time off while retaining job security and status. In 1998, 
1998, Sweden started the Right to Leave to Conduct a Business Operation Act. It gives employees the right to take a leave of absence of up to six months to start their own company. That is, if the company won't be a competitor to their current employer. Stockholm has its own Silicon Valley. Several startups born there have been valued at more than a billion dollars, like Spotify, Candy Crush, Minecraft, and Skype, the last two of which were bought by Microsoft. In Sweden, there are 20 startups for every thousand employees versus five for every thousand in the US. And for some of those entrepreneurs who may have come into wealth along the way, there's an absence of other taxes they would maybe have to pay if they lived elsewhere. Sweden has, is actually quite friendly to uh, large owners of, of capital. We don't have taxes on property, uh, no tax on wealth, no tax on gifts or inheritance. Uh, but instead, it's um, it comes from in income taxes, but also from consumption taxes. And, and that's the major difference between Sweden and the United States. We have almost as much in value-added taxes on consumption and excise taxes on different uh, goods as we get in income taxes. Somewhere between high employment rates, high taxes, and support to those with the entrepreneurial spirit, Sweden's economy has stayed strong. Sweden, though, isn't immune to the ongoing global growth slowdown. In fact, the Swedish krona has been the worst performing major currency in 2019. I think the outlook, as for many other countries, is that growth will become somewhat lower. And of course, there are many uncertainties. Also, things happening outside Sweden or the Nordic countries which affect, uh, affect Sweden. But they are sort of pretty OK compared to, uh, to other countries. Okay, guys, uh, basically, this is what I got for you. And also, I want to remind you that you have over here, um, oh, what is this? You have over here in Neo, you have a couple of videos, and also you have the PowerPoint, and also the questions that you need to complete over here, vocabulary and assignment that you need to complete. It has to be ready in your notebook. Now that we are here, let's watch this video that talks basically about the same thing, the mixed market. What is a mixed economy? A mixed economy is an economy that is a, a mix economy, of a market economy in which there is a uh, free exchange of goods in a private market and a planned economy which is totally controlled by a government entity. A mixed economy has elements of both where there is some uh, free exchange in the private sector but also uh, rules and regulations uh, administered by uh, a government. Um, there is definitely a great contrast between the economic policies of George Bush in the United States and Barack Obama. Um, George Bush definitely was more geared towards pushing a market economy. Barack Obama was more geared to rules and regulations administered by government, but both are actually administering a mixed economy with their elements of both private and public uh, sector actions. Uh, even a country like China, which is a, a, a politically a one-party ruled country, the Communist Party, there are still elements of capitalism in China, most notably Hong Kong, uh, a huge uh, banking banking center full of, of private enterprise. Uh, so as a technical matter, even Communist China is a mixed economy. Okay, so this is the video that I have for you today, and then uh, tomorrow we'll complete uh, this real brief chapter about this mixed economy, guys. Do you have any question? questions? Now, I, I want to ask something to, uh, what was the name? Eileen uh, uh, Rodriguez. Remember you asked me what was the stock market? Did you look up for that, <laughs> that video about stock market? Are you clear now what stock market is, Eileen? Eileen, where are you? Okay, Eileen asked me last week, well, what, what is a stock market? O sea, el mercado de valores. And I tried to explain it, 
Okay, did you, oh, you, okay, you're okay, okay. Now, in case you don't know, then look it up in YouTube what a stock market is. So there are some companies that need to finance their, their, their investment. So they, they take the, the, the company and they open like, they, they took it stock or shares and they sell it in this market. And there are some people who, who, buys, who buy it. So, and that way the company, the big company, they have inter, in, enterprises, they have uh, money in order to make all the investment and try to grow their business. So that's, that's the basic, that's, that's the meaning of, uh, um, or that's the purpose of a stock market, okay, guys? Okay, then we'll finish this topic uh, on Friday. Remember, try to complete uh, this vocabulary and assignment. I'm not gonna tell you when I'm gonna ask for it, so you have to have it. You have to keep it ready, okay? So that's up to you guys. Now, remember, next week you have the second, the second test, test number two. And it's about um, my economy and market economy. Real, real easy, the topic, okay, guys? So please, um, if you wanna get to it, it's gonna be tough, let me tell you. It's gonna be tough. <laughs> but anyway, if you study, I think you'll, you'll have a good grade, okay, guys? So see you next week, uh, next week, next Friday. Bye-bye, take care, see ya.